Welcome to the Biohackers Podcast. My name is Teemu Arna, I'm your host, and today's guest is medical doctor uh, Beth Haley from UK. But before that, I want to tell you about Biohackers Summit that's just behind the corner. Uh, and here in Finland right now, it is snowing. It, uh, we have like several tens of centimeters of snow and I barely got to the office today. I usually cycle to office, but today it was absolutely impossible. The snow is early. And if you are coming to the Biohacker Summit, one of our topics is cold and uh, how humans can adapt to cold temperatures. One of our experts is Dr. Rhonda Patrick, who is going to share some of the health benefits for uh, of cold for longevity and mitochondrial function and health in general, shutting down inflammation and so on. So if you're interested in that, uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick has not been in Europe uh, that often, but now she will be in Finland at the Biker Summit on 18th of November. And you can see more information about the event at biakersummit.com. And so will be Dr. Beth Haley. Uh, welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having me. So you are a research uh, MD and, and you worked, uh, you're working for the European Space Agency, right? Yeah, so I was at Concordia Station um, in 2015 um, on the Concordia Spaceflight Analog um, in Antarctica. I'm doing the research for ESA there. Oh, that's cool. So you are a UK trained doctor. Um, what got you interested in something that took you to such a cold environment? So I've always um, enjoyed cold environments, I guess, um, really through a love of skiing when I was younger, um, and things have really just escalated from there. So I spent lots of time working up in the Arctic. So I've been in Greenland, Svalbard, Siberia, um, and North Pole before I went down actually to Antarctica. So I guess um, that's really what led to me working for ESA on the Antarctic platform was that prior experience of working in those cold remote environments. Hmm. So when it comes to Antarctica, uh, my understanding is that to study hu kind of extreme human conditions, what we would meet, for example, in space, uh, there's very few places on Earth where you can do that uh, easily and safely. And, and one of those would be Antarctica. So, so what is, why is that? Yeah, so Antarctica is a brilliant platform um, for a number of different reasons for spaceflight research. So it's really looking towards long duration spaceflight missions. So um, we're really looking at the isolation during the overwinter time because that informs us a lot about what it's going to be like for astronauts going a bit further than on the International Space Station as they are at the moment. So if we're to have a medical problem up in space on the International Space Station, typically um, we can evacuate an astronaut within the day. Um, um, and probably a lot sooner than that. Um, this isn't going to be the case when we're looking to go a lot further. Um, and so this is what we're really simulating in the environments like Concordia, um, where you have the overwinter period where you're completely isolated as a crew um, for those nine months. And so we're looking at the effects of that on the crew, both their physiology, psychology, and also the medical models that we're using in those environments to help inform us um, about how to look after astronauts in the future. Hmm. I would imagine it's not just uh, physical health, but also psychological health when it comes to being isolated. Uh, what can you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges of a place like Concordia. So it's much more of a challenge than looking after yourself in the cold. Um, and sort of a lot of it's a lot about all the crew interactions and team dynamics that um, we have on the base there. So that's that's one of the really interesting things about the research that we're doing down there. We're sort of looking at the effects of that. Right. So so what what kind of uh, situations uh, uh, specifically? would you look at uh, uh, when when you're looking at that aspect of uh, are people like going to freak out or I mean what is what is the case um, so to give you an idea of some of the experiments we're doing we're doing kind of um, doing experiments where we're looking at 
um, how the crew is reacting and really looking at critical time points in the mission. So the way that we're monitoring that is we're wearing activity watches um, and my watch um, would interact with other people other people within the crew's watches as well. So we're able to detect how long people are spending together um, and where they're actually spending that time on the base and how that's changing over time. So from that data, we're able to tell whether people are looking to sort of seek out social interaction um, or, in fact, isolate themselves and at the different time points and when this is happening. And also you can see when there's conflicts forming within the group and also the formation of subgroups, um, which is typical of a crew size of 13. So that's the kind of data that we're getting in terms of crew dynamics, um, but also um, we're doing video diaries as well. So from that data, we're hoping to be able to pick up nonverbal cues um, and develop software to help us recognize um, how people are feeling regardless of what they're saying. So. I mean, those are just a few of the experiments that we are running at Concordia. And of course, every year it changes. So they've just finished the overwinter this year as well. And they had a whole load of different experiments taking place um, when they were doing that as well. That sounds very sophisticated. So you mentioned an activity tracker. I mean, someone who is into quantified self and tracking myself 24-7 with different wearables and biometric shirts and so on. I would yeah. be extremely interested in what kind of sensors and data you're getting out of those in, in that kind of research environment. Um, I, I would imagine you're looking at some kind of uh, proximity sensors and, and, and to understand uh, where people are uh, around the base and, and how close they are to, to each other. But do you also gather bio, bio uh, metric data like heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, etc. Yeah, definitely. So the the watches we're using, they were activity watches. So we're looking at activity levels. We could detect from that also sleep wake cycles as well, um, which is really interesting at a platform like Concordia because you have the long polar night as well, um, where you have a hundred days without any sunlight, and that really affects people's sleep wake cycle too. So we're able to get loads of data from um, this, these sort of simple watches. Hmm. And um, the way we're detecting them, it's kind of like a um, beacon transceiver method. So it's um, it's like when you go skiing, um, so you have sort of um, beacons and receivers. Hmm. So uh, the, the light cycle is very interesting to a lot of biohackers. I mean, what I have right here is like uh, blue light blogging glasses. And uh, <laughs> this is what I sometimes use in the evenings. Uh, to make sure that my I'm not dis disrupting my biological or, or circadian rhythm. Uh, so how how does uh, can you what can you tell about light? Uh, I read from an article about you online that uh, you would spend long periods of time without sunshine, for example. Yeah, so yeah, it was 105 days that we didn't see the sun at all, um, and then sort of. It was a little bit longer before we had the 24-hour sunlight that you have in Antarctica for the rest of the time. Um, and that really affected people. So before I went down, I was really used to having the 24-hour daylight. Um, and so I thought that probably I would be able to cope quite well with the 24-hour dark darkness as well. Um, in fact, I found that I was find it really difficult to sleep during this period. So I spent the first week probably completely awake. Um, and then all I wanted to do was sleep for the next week. So it's really hard to regulate that and to keep a normal, um, normal pattern. And I think most of our crew also struggled with that. Um, and also it's difficult because obviously within friendship groups, you have to be awake at the same time as the other people. Um, and also communication within the crew. So, in fact, one of the things that we did was we um, made lunch and dinner times a compulsory part of the day um, to make sure that everybody was still sort of on the same um, schedule and also able to interact and communicate with everybody. Because um, it would have been very easy for everyone to sort of make their own schedule during that period where you didn't have the point of reference of um, day and night. Hmm. So, um, th welcome to Finland, by the way. It's pitch, yeah. it's pitch black part of the year, especially when you go to Lapland. Now, did you use some like what I would call biohacks? Did you use like uh, daylight lamps or anything like this to synchronize the biological clock? Or were you just like uh, researching what happens to people in uh, uh, such conditions? Um, it has been um, experimented on in the past, certainly. Um, and at Halley Station, where we're also running the ESA experiments, they actually have um, lights to sort of wake them up in the morning, um, similar lights 
to those you're um, talking about. Um, we have them at Concordia as well, although it's not part of the research that we're doing there. So the crew can just use them as they as they like there. So it's not something that we're looking at specifically, um, but certainly something that we use down there. Hmm. That this time of the year, I'm definitely using one of these daylight lamps right next to my desk, yeah. and it really helps with my uh, feeling of alertness. Now. When you went for lunch at Concordia, you mentioned that you had the Milky Way above you. Um, so, so what can you tell about uh, light in general? I mean, here in uh, uh, in in developed countries where we have a lot of light pollution going on all the time, even if it's dark city environment, there is always some light lurking from somewhere. Um, I would imagine that. Uh, there you could like experience like real darkness and you could also uh, see that stars in completely different light yeah i mean it was beautiful um i've never really been particularly a stargazer um but when i went down and saw those stars for the first time i suddenly sort of changed my mind and i was like wow um we have an astronomer he's there full time um, for the winter and he spent his entire time outside and getting really excited about what he could see because it's it's probably one of the best places in the world to see the stars and yeah as you say you go out at lunchtime dinner time breakfast um and you just be able to see the milky way clear as day all the time so at concordia we don't have much precipitation which means that you can see the stars really really clearly um and that's in fact why concordia is built where it is because because of that um it means that um it's a really good drilling site um, because we don't have much precipitation Hmm. Um, so that was definitely one of the highlights for me and we also saw of course the southern lights um as well as the stars so that was yeah it was wonderful what other aspects uh did you notice affecting the crew? I mean, in addition to darkness, you had probably extreme cold temperatures. Uh, uh, what else? Um, so I guess, well, I mean, those are the main factors. I guess the, the effect of the cold really is the fact that you can't go sort of outside and clear your head. So you're very confined to the base. Um, again, as you would be on long duration space flights. So that was another, um, big challenge for us as a crew. Um, and also staying fit in an environment like that as well, where you're sort of not able to go outside and go on a run or go skiing or all that kind of thing. So, um, so I guess really confinement was definitely something. Um, all sorts of things I I guess not being able to go home for all that time and see people as well that's a, of course a challenge and also limited communications as well so we did have internet at Concordia but um, but you know it's not, not the same as we have back here as well Sure let's talk about cold a little bit I mean um, what kind of temperatures did you uh, rec record and how did it feel? So during the overwinter, um, we were typically between minus 70 and minus 80, um, and that's sort of ambient temperature. And we, with wind chill, it would sometimes go below minus 100. So really quite cold, yeah. <laughs> what kind of gear do you need? I, I would imagine you didn't kind of like uh, go in your underwear uh, out there. <laughs> <laughs> they were actually at midwinter um, we sort of went from the sauna and ran around the base so those very cold temperatures but that was just a one-off day Seriously? Um, so yeah absolutely <laughs> that's, that's like, like risking the mission <laughs> <laughs> don't do that on mars right yeah that's it. yeah yes. um no certainly so we um uh, yeah, so we wore these um, huge big suits, um, and under that I would wear lots of other layers as well. So we wear the big outer suits, which are sort of full of down, um, and also have the fur hoods on them, um, big bath and boots. Um, and then under that I would wear another down jacket, and then also lots of other layers as well, so sort of merino wool and um, fleeces as well. So a huge, huge amount of layers, which meant you were a bit like Mitchell and Mom walking outside. So, um, And again, that you have really limited dexterity as well because you're wearing the big mitts and sort of three layers of gloves under that as well so it's really hard to do anything outside especially um, with sort of fiddly scientific equipment that we have there as well so that was another big challenge for us all did you have any kind of like special um special garments or anything like the like like boots that could heat themselves or anything like this 
Uh, we didn't actually have boots that heat themselves, but we have the big, um, big Sorrels, um, and also sort of Baffin boots as well. So they were they were pretty effective, to be honest. And and also um, we would only ever go out for sort of short periods at a time, um, and sort of go between shelters. So at Concordia, outside of the base, you have um, all these smaller shelters which are heated. Um, and so you sort of hop between them. So if you're going a long distance, you wouldn't just walk all that way. Um, you just go between all these bases um, to get there, um, which meant that it was a lot safer and that you could stay warm because at those kind of temperatures, you just can't stay out for, for a long time safely. Hmm. But certainly up in Greenland, I've used sort of the, the heated boots as well and, and have experience of that too, so, which then they're brilliant for skiing, especially. <laughs> I could imagine that. So... Um, what kind? Of, I mean, as a as a doctor, what kind of health effects would you would you notice in in those kind of extreme conditions? With, uh, you mentioned lack of sleeping, or maybe being a bit sleepy also throughout the day because of uh, uh, the lack of sunlight and, and synchronization uh, with the daily cycle. Um, uh, extreme co- while, while being under extreme cold temperatures. So, so what what were kind of the phys- physiological effects that you could see? I mean, yeah, certainly. It is a big physical um, and psychological challenge for everyone down there. I think most people lost weight. Uh, well, actually, I, I know everybody lost weight apart from um, one person in our crew. Um, and really, I did feel by the end of the um, experience that I was sort of falling apart slightly. Like, I think I don't think I could have done another winter there because I'd lost so much weight. Um, and just i think psychologically i think one year is is a long time and to do two i think i would have certainly struggled um and i think that was reflected in all of the crew i mean in terms of um, medical problems it's very specific to um to individual crew members in terms of what we were experiencing um it's really dry there so we had lots of problems um with sort of the dryness as well so skin um and sort of affecting us in that way as well so right right very very low low humidity um sounds like finnish homes pretty much um, in the <laughs> time so i'm using a diffuser right now at my office basically diffusing some some uh, uh more water content in the air and also back back there i have some plants um i mean by the way did you have any plants over there or just like you know. No, so um, that's another thing. So because of the Antarctic Treaty, um, we're not actually able to grow anything in Antarctica. There are some experiments using hydroponic growing, um, but it has to be sort of part of a formal research program, and we can't just sort of have um, have plants growing there because you're introducing new species into um, that environment, which could potentially be harmful. So, hmm. so no. So I didn't have any fresh fruit or vegetables for nine months, which uh, was again a bit of a struggle. What kind of food did you eat like for for the whole duration? Was that like canned food or what, what's going on there? Well, lots of frozen food. Um, so of course you have like the natural freezers outside. So um, a lot of it was frozen. We had dried food and uh, of course, as you say, canned food and just preser- preserved food as well. So um, we actually have an Italian chef who's down there. So the food was pretty good. <laughs> Um, so I can't complain too much, but I certainly did miss having any sort of fresh fruit and vegetables. And um, that was a real struggle for me. Right on. So, um, I mean, what is at stake uh, the most while being in an isolated location? What, uh, what do you need to supplement with, for example? Um, in terms of nutrition or? Yeah, I mean, is, is there like anything specific? You mentioned that people were losing weight. Um, I would imagine you you still had your kind of calorie intake at your uh, basal metabolic rate, but still you were losing weight and uh, definitely cold temperatures do affect things like brown adipose tissue um, activation and and through that um, burning of uh, fat from the body, so uh, cold thermogenesis and so on. But uh, um, if you if you look at that aspect like losing weight and making sure that you're nourished did you look at that aspect um we didn't that wasn't um part of the experimental protocols that i was doing um my year in concordia but certainly that's something that's being considered a lot in the polio environments in general and certainly um in those kind of cold environments we're burning a lot more um calories than we would be back 
um, back here. And also we're at altitude as well there. So that again is another confounding factor. So actually Concordia we're 3,300 meters, which makes us sort of an alpine equivalent of about 4,000. Um, so again, that's another thing which um, increases our energy requirements as well. Um, so all those things combined and also the change in diet as well. So not having those fresh fruit and vegetables um, and also quite similar food all the time, um, again, sort of reduces people's appetite. And also um, just the long night time, I guess, sort of you're aware in um, Finland that that can sometimes suppress your appetite as well because it kind of feels like you're eating at sort of four in the morning when in fact it's lunchtime. So I think all those um, factors um, together was why people were losing the weight there at Concordia. Yeah. You you mentioned uh, exercise and so on. So what kind of health and training programs were designed for people uh, who would live there? So um, we have really good access to sort of health facilities. So we have a really well-equipped good gym there um, and so that was our main source of exercise was using that um, but I mean also just going outside is very physical in itself um, and so some people's jobs um, were sort of going outside every day and in that kind of environment that sort of keeps you very fit as well because you're wearing all the gear um, and also sort of fighting with the cold as well so it's a combination it depended on the individual um, certainly we've done lots of experiments looking at the sort of exercise regimes and things as well in the past at Concordia and my year specifically we weren't um, looking at that um, but certainly there was support for people in terms of um, training schedules. Hmm. So, so uh, what, what type of training did you do? Was that like something like high intensity intervals or, or like uh, lifting weights so, so, uh, or just like running on a treadmill? Oh, it depended on the person and sort of, you know, it's perf- personal preference. I mean, I'm I'm a treadmill person, so that's what I tended to do um, rather than the weights. But um, I mean, certainly it's everything's available for for people to use there depending on what they want to do. Hmm. Right on. Um, so if you take those extreme conditions, uh, uh, what kind of interventions would you deploy to make sure that humans would better adapt to to those kind of uh, conditions or or in retrospect what would you do um, to counter some of the, the the things that you noticed um in in what respect sorry countering the sort of sunlight yeah. or the extreme conditions yeah i mean i mean sort of like cold and uh, combination with a lack lack of uh, sunlight and uh, um uh, limited uh, diets uh, that that you were into. So, so what would you do differently? What what kind of interventions would you design uh, based on your experience? Uh, well, I mean, lots of different things. I guess. Um, I mean, for morale and for everybody, um, food was a big issue. I think um, in terms of the fresh fruit and vegetables. We had a chef, of course, who was incredible and really good with what he um, what he had available. But certainly, that would be something that I thought was a big um, issue for our crew. And again, that's something that they're looking towards um, for space flight as well. So currently, up on the ISS, they're now looking at programs um, which are looking to um, be able to sort of grow fresh fruit and vegetables up in space. Um, and that's certainly something that I think would be really important um, for long duration missions. Um, so that's one small part of um, a lot of the research that we're doing there. I guess the other um, main thing that we were learning from um, the data that we're collecting at Concordia is this sort of critical um, time points where people are more at risk of um, different things happening um, in terms of sort of isolating themselves or or sort of when you are seeking out um, social interaction. So I think um, things like that and having a better idea about how people are going to cope and when people are most at risk of um, having problems um, will really help us inform us and um, help us prevent problems that Occurring um, in future missions. Um, we're also developing loads of tools. So, um, to give you another example, is um, one experiment we were doing, we were looking at cognition testing. So, we're looking at a wide range of um, factors, so risk taking behavior, memory testing, um, reaction times. Um, and the idea of this experiment is that um, astronauts are going to be doing this on a regular basis, um, testing themselves against themselves. And essentially, a dip in performance is really a red flag um, for mission control to see. Um, 
see that there's a problem and then sort of to do further investigation about why that problem is occurring. So those kind of um, tools are going to help um, with future missions, um, both in space and in Antarctica, to sort of monitor people and really just um, highlight when um, people might be having problems. So all those things together, I think, are really um, going to hopefully help us in the future. I would imagine that those kind of uh, tests would be useful for anyone uh, operating heavy machinery or, or being in, in mission critical controls. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a wide range of um, transferable applications for a lot of the research that we're doing there. Um, so for the altitude stuff, um, you know, that's looking at hypoxia, so sort of low oxygen levels, um, which is really relevant to people in a wide range of different um, circumstances. Um, you know, for example, intensive care and patients which aren't able to oxygenate themselves as well um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we're looking at the effects of artificial lighting on the eyesight, which is really useful in a whole wide range of um, um, conditions and um, for example factory workers who are working on night shifts um, for a majority of the time as well so there's lots of ways that this research um, can help benefit people back here on earth and not just in space um, absolutely. absolutely which is why it's really exciting to be involved in it yeah you mentioned the the, uh, the spectrum of light and artificial light so um, I mean I'm using Right now I have some LED lights here and I have a daylight, daylight lamp as well. Um, the research that I've looked at is that today when we have LED-based lights, they often the, the spectrum cuts off right before infrared range. And it turns out that the infrared range is extremely important for human health. Uh, what happens mm -hmm. at sunset and uh, we used to have incandescent light bulbs that uh, actually produced quite a lot of uh, infrared range that is uh, just to put things simply uh, anti-inflammatory and uh, mm -hmm. and so on so 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 did you look at that and what did you learn from it uh, so we weren't specifically looking at the lights in that respect um, we were more looking at pupil reactions um, based on the use of the artificial lighting over that period of time um, but unfortunately because the research that we're doing hasn't been published yet I can't really sort of comment on what we found um, from those experiments yet Sure. Unfortunately, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So, um, when it comes to uh, to to taking what what you saw there, now now is is the first application for uh, let's say a long distance uh, flight like going to the Mars? Uh, is that like uh, one of the main interests of uh, the transferability of of the research? Yeah, I mean, so ESA and NASA and, and space agencies in general um, have lots of different platforms, um, which are sort of called it analog environments. So you've got underwater ones, ones in deserts. Um, you've got high seas, which you might have heard of, which is the um, the one out in Hawaii being run by NASA. And all of them have benefits um, and sort of over the other ones. None, none of them are perfect um, examples of um, space flight, apart from, of course, the ISS. But even that has limitations in terms of future long duration spaceflight missions so um, the real thing that we're looking at at Concordia is the fact that we have this isolation period that's the main um, reason that we're doing the research there of course we are also looking at the light levels and the altitude um, and the other parts as well um, but so Concordia really yes we are looking towards those longer duration missions so for example going to Mars um, as compared to other um analog platforms, for example, bed rest studies, which are more specifically looking at just long, um, long times in microgravity, so long period of times in microgravity, which is applicable to the space station, um, just being there for a long period of time. So Concordia really is looking towards that sort of isolation of being on sort of a further away mission. Mm. If you made uh, the, I, th I think Antarctica and Concordia has been also called the White Mars. Uh, so, mm -hmm. how would you compare? Like, uh, what comparisons do you see with Mars and being in Antarctica? Well, I mean, the conditions are pretty similar. So we're actually doing an experiment called Backfinder, which is looking um, to find bacteria, sort of extreme bacteria, which can survive in environments like Concordia. Um, so the idea of this is if um, we're able to find um, new species which are able to survive in those kind of conditions, then perhaps they can also survive on other planets like, like Mars, for example. 
Um, I think just from a sort of living there point of view, certainly some days, especially during the um, the winter time where you don't have the sun, um, it really did feel like that you're on a different planet. It was a really strange experience. So. I think when you're there and you have the sun during the summer, everything's kind of familiar because you have the sun, which is something that you have back here, mm. back here in um, Europe. Um, but certainly when we lost that sun, you really did feel like you sort of lost connection um, with the rest of the world. And it really did feel like a completely different place that you're at. So I can totally um, relate to why people call it White Mars. I see. I see. Um, you mentioned bacteria uh, did you like spend your days going around the the station and collecting samples uh, to grow in a petri dish? Yeah, so I spent a lot of time um, at taking samples. I wasn't growing them at Concordia. I was taking snow samples, which have since been um, transported back to Germany, where they're now being analysed. So, um, so yeah, that was certainly a big part of um, one of the research projects that I was doing called Backfinder. Um, and actually, this um, sort of the January just gone, um, I was part of an overland traverse, um, and I got to drive from the coast of um, Antarctica back to Concordia, which is one thousand. 300 kilometers um, and during that time we were taking snow samples along the whole route and that was a really exciting um, part of the trip for me because um, it was a, an amazing opportunity to get to um, take snow samples in areas which have perhaps been previously untouched because you're just walking away from um, where the tractors normally drive but of course that only happens twice a year so um, the chances are where you're walking off into is, um, is a place that no one's ever been before so that was really Really exciting, and I'm really looking forward to um, finding out um, what we've, what if anything, um, we find from those samples. So fingers crossed, <laughs> we find something interesting. Alien life, uh, get mm. the genie out of the bottle. So um, mm. when you would, um, uh, I mean, uh, looking at your background, you also mentioned that you're a patron of extreme medicine. What do, what do you mean by that? Uh, so um, Extreme Medicine um, or Expedition Medicine um, is a company in the UK um, and it's doing um, training for medical professionals looking um, to sort of be working in extreme environments. So that's something that I'm involved in. Hmm. So um, tell me something. Um, when it comes to living in extreme conditions, let's say, you know, someone who lives in extreme altitudes or someone who lives in uh, far in the north, uh, like some people here in Finland, and uh, uh, or, or just like in the depths or whatever, extreme conditions. As a medical doctor who has researched these topics, so uh, what kind of like generally speaking um, uh, inspirational or interesting can you tell about um, what you have found? Uh, in terms of, yeah, it's it's kind of an open question. So, I just want to dig deeper into your expertise. So, when it comes to uh, extreme medicine and and these kind of conditions, like, um, uh, kind of what kind of anecdotes can you bring up uh, from your work and and studying humans on the boundaries of uh, uh, just being able to stay alive? Um. It's kind of <laughs> such an open question. Um, I guess, I guess for me, um, the main things that I've learned, sort of, in working in these environments, is very much sort of the human side of um, living part of small, um, isolated communities. So that's certainly a big um, thing that um, that I've learned about. Um, I guess before we actually go to Concordia and we do what's called human behaviour performance training at the European National Centre and again that's all about how to live and work together as part of an effective team um, and a lot of that training is looking really to sort of see how and learn about how people are going to react in, in those environments and also sort of being able to recognise when people are having problems and having you know a bad time and just having that awareness um, so I guess that's one of the, the biggest things that I've personally learned um, about sort of working and living in these places. Right on. So 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 what is kind of common for all these extreme conditions? If you go there as a team, it's going to challenge you physically and mentally. And uh, what you're saying is that the mental side 
it's surprisingly important for the success of any 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 type of mission like that and to be able to recognize and and i, I would imagine that leadership in in those kind of environments is, is some something where we would apply uh, information coming out of this right yeah definitely leadership and communication um within the crew communication is really really important and i think um a lot of the reasons that people run into trouble is when um we have poor communication um so i'd say yeah leadership and communication certainly are are big big players hmm. so so let's let's go there uh a little bit so when it comes to teamwork in 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 those kind of environments you mentioned earlier that um you are running these cognitive tests to see people's reaction time and alertness, and that is very important when when people are performing. Um, uh, the inv- inv- uh, the environment can influence people's uh, sleeping patterns and cycles that they might be out of sync with the rest of the team. Uh, w- what else are you kind of like seeing uh, that is, uh, uh, let's say, dangering uh, the, the the potential success? Uh, of, of, of the mission um sorry i don't really oh you didn't get. get it okay so let me repeat sorry <laughs> so so um when people go into these extreme conditions uh, one of the things that that will affect their ability to do teamwork is uh, the alertness level that is influenced by environmental factors like light and and, and uh, sleeping patterns mm-hmm. and so on um uh, what what else are you seeing, like uh, uh, on a psychological level? I would imagine like hanging around with the same faces all the time is already kind of like you want some privacy, and uh, factoring that in might be one one thing. So so what else are you seeing? So so if you if you made a list of the things that typically come up on the surface uh, as people um, go into those conditions, I guess. Um things that people struggle with so um would be things like the, your role within the crew um and within the team and so you're sort of finding that initially um kind of i mean it's it's so specific to um to each team i think it's difficult to really sort of say um exactly kind of hmm. i'm not sure if i'm really <laughs> um i'm just trying to think of examples how, um, how is how is the leadership? Is there like one one person who is kind of like in charge, or is it like very flat when it comes to your missions that you you look overseen? Uh, well, I mean, it, of course, depends on the uh, mission, and the environment that you're working in. Um, at Concordia specifically, um, yeah, we certainly we have. Um, we have a station leader um, and we also have sort of technical managers as well. So we have sort of two main leaders and then. Of course, there's sort of other people within the group which are very influential, and um, so yeah, there certainly is like a hierarchy um, in terms of that side of things. Um, and there is clear leadership, which is important um, for those crews. Yeah, yeah. So, so why I'm asking this is that um, the if, if a crew member, I mean, the number of people in a in a crew is like thirteen. Um, it's it's kind of like a unit you know in the army for example and uh, some of the research they've done is that uh, why why do we have like units that are eight to ten twelve people is that then all of those people will be able to know each other and uh, they, they will be able to relate to each other more easily uh, as you grow the number of people they will build this kind of uh, packs and uh, just like hang around with 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 small circles of people and and that would create a divide so i would i would imagine the number of people you had on the mission is also chosen very uh, uh deliberately yeah although i mean within a crew of 13 you would expect subgroups to form and it's probably not the size of the crew which we're going to be sending on a longer duration mission so in that respect concordia is in fact limited um because probably more likely would be looking at a crew size similar to that on the iss so a crew of six where you're less likely to have these subgroup forming um certainly at concordia you really see the difference between the um the summer and the winter so during the summer there's a lot more people there and certainly you have these sort of bigger subsections and um groups 
groups forming compared to um, the winter. But certainly within a crew of 13, you you would typically also still um, expect to see these groups um, sort of gradually forming as well. Right. Uh, yeah, and so, certainly sort of, um, you do tend to find, say, midwinter is very like critical or not critical, but um, it's sort of a very definitive time for the crew um, in terms of um, the formation of these groups. And typically after midwinter, um, you don't see much change within um, who sort of is in these different groups. Right. So, so um, what kind of interventions would you have then for the the psychological, mental health of of the people involved. I would imagine in a year-long mission, you you would probably see everything happening. People people like uh, becoming homesick or just you know losing their marbles, uh, etc. Or are they highly trained, every single one, to mentally uh, to to resist that kind of uh, human side? <laughs> So we are really prepared as a crew. Um, so as I mentioned before, we do this human behavior performance training. So that really helps set us up um, and prepare us before we go. Um, also, there's a lot of psychological testing before you would get to go to a platform like Concordia. So before I even had my interview, I had lots of um, different psychological testing as well. So as a crew, you're really, really well prepared. Of course, that's not to say that problems don't occur, um, but certainly um, we do try and minimize that as much as possible. Um, um, before we go down there so it's not a huge part of life at Concordia hmm. but certainly you know we do have a psychological challenge but in terms of sort of medical problems with um, psychological problems it's yeah and um, yeah hmm. so so did you did you like measure people's like um, blood values or anything like this to 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 look at this uh, kind of like I mean low core uh, high cortisol or low testosterone or, you know, uh, whatever markers that would indicate um, some issues. Yeah, so we did um, lots of testing. Um, so we did uh, tests which were just sort of on a personal basis for people um, to sort of monitor their own health. Um, and then we also did them in terms of the experiments as well. So we did lots of different um, blood tests depending on the experiments. We also did saliva um, tests. We had urine samples during the winter um, as well. So all sorts of different tests, um, hair samples, um, everything really. Hmm. Uh, we'll, and all of those, we're looking at different things um, depending on the protocols. Um, we're looking at blood pressure regulation as well. Um, so that was another experiment that we were running there and looking at how how that environment was affecting people. Is there any results you could share from that? Like how, how does that kind of like extreme environment affect something like blood pressure? Um, unfortunately, um, that's another one which I can't really share what we found yet. But hopefully the results are going to be out in the not too distant future for these kind of experiments. So, um, sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. We are all eager, all eager to learn more about that or we just have to like take our own measurements here in the mm -hmm. north and figure out what's going on. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in circadian uh, health and... Uh, how it affects humans. Definitely there is like kind of seasonal depression that a lot of people are fighting um, in, uh, in in long periods of darkness. And there's all kinds of nutritional interventions from taking vitamin D supplements to um, using light, light therapy and, and so on to just like mm. counteract some of that. But still, I mean, even if you take like vitamin D, the sun is not just vitamin D. Uh, there is so much more going on when you are isolated from sunlight. Uh, and uh, for example, just like the uh, I think it's nitrate storages on on the skin and um, all, all kinds of things that can lead to disease um, and inflammation over time. Uh, not to mention the dryness and, and what that does to sinuses and and so on. So so. Uh, is there, is there anything like um, specific that you would add um, on on kind of the long term uh, things that people should be aware of? Um, I think you've covered most of those in terms of long term. In term uh, it's more sort of the short term in terms of um, 
I mean, you have FT3 syndrome as well occurring. So people find that they um, sort of losing some of their short term memory during the the long polar night as well. So that was something that um, a few of us noticed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you've covered most of the most of the things. I mean, certainly in terms of morale, like the sun was um, a big factor in terms of the crew. Um, and you really did notice, and, and just energy levels as well. But I guess that's um, similar to Scandinavia in that respect as well. Hmm. Uh, do you know, by the way, why some people are more susceptible to uh, this, this kind of uh, depressive uh, and, and, and health issues when it comes to cold and darkness? <laughs> um, no, and I, I'm not sure if... Um if, uh, I'm not really sure of the research on that at the moment, but it wasn't really something that we were specifically looking at um, in terms of susceptibility and why some people are more affected than others. Um, right. Um, is, the, is there? Um, we have covered a lot of ground here, uh, or uh, or ice, uh, whatever. So, what uh, else would you bring up that would be beneficial to the listeners to know about your? Um, your time at, at Concordia and, and the work that you did there? Um, just that um, I think it's really important that people are aware that these um, programs are going on, so it's sort of all the space for analogs and the research that we're doing, and um, I think it's really exciting to be part of, um, sort of, uh, to have had the experience of working within the space industry, because there's so much sort of amazing research that they're doing, which um, can really benefit us all back here on Earth as well, so I think um, really being part of that sort of bigger community, bigger scientific community um, is really exciting. So I guess it's it's that really. Yeah, absolutely, certainly. And also, sort of big sign of like um, good international collaboration in terms of the the scientific research that we're doing, both in Antarctica and in space in general. I would I would agree with that, and there is a lot of research that uh, a lot of biohackers are already using um, that comes from studying humans uh, at peak performance or extreme conditions. Uh, just to mention one that would be heart rate variability um, well mm-hmm. studied by the Soviets uh, already back in, back in those days when they were sending cosmonauts to space because it's kind okay. of hard to do thorough medical assessment in space so they start looking at the, the electric signals from the body and what, what could be understood from there algorithmically mm. so, so there is a lot of uh, interesting stuff that comes out um, from space uh, and research uh, into that domain and definitely we are living very interesting times with space travel now now also that it's kind of partly going private because of the initiatives like uh, Elon Musk and, and others who are in a SpaceX program and so on um, mm. lo- looking at uh, potential uh, consumer level even uh, uh, space uh, flights uh, sometime in the future uh, or just yeah. like sending people one way to Mars, whatnot. So um, it's it's definitely opening up um, from the, let's say, uh, government funded uh, side and and becoming a very interesting domain for a lot of investors also. Um, who are yeah, absolutely. Yeah, building startups, etc. There. Oh, so um, thank you so much, Dr. Beth Haley. Uh, this was fascinating, and I'm definitely looking forward to to your talk and what you can also show uh, in terms of how it looked like uh, to live in those conditions. Um, and uh, uh, it's fascinating work. And um, uh, I think every listener is, is eager to wait for the results being published from your research. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, sorry, I can't tell you a lot of um, the research yeah. and stuff that we actually find um, during my year there because, yeah, it's not been published yet. Yeah, so if people want to know more and see what's being published, and uh, I know that you had some travel logs and, and you were basically producing content also while there. So so where, where should people head if they want to see what's going on on Con- at Concordia right now or in the past? And um, so if you just go online to the ESA website, so European Space Agency website, and there's a whole section on Concordia and you can find out all about the research that we're doing down there and sort of what life is like on the base. So, yeah, there's lots of resources um, available online to look at sort of the experiments and things that we are doing at Concordia. Is there any uh, 
book re- uh, any any book recommendations you would make um, to people who are fascinated about this topic? Um, in terms of books, there's a I mean there's a few sort of interesting books, but um, sort of extremes is um, is quite relevant. Um, but not there's there aren't any books which are specifically looking at Concordia or the yeah. Um, yeah. the research we're if, doing. If there. you just gave like a few of your your favorite ones that you've been fascinated in. Uh, um, so there's um, life at the extremes or um, extreme medicine, <laughs> um, but I'll I'll, um, I'll send you the links. That's probably the best. Awesome, that would be fantastic. Okay. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, and um, I'm looking forward to meeting you here in Helsinki, Finland, uh, just about week time. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs>